Greetings and welcome, one and all, to Ironcast. Now, Ironcast is a fairly new game recently released on Steam and Humble Store. Uh, that is today, released today on the 26th of March. Though, fortunately, I was furnished with a copy by the developer a little while ago. Just enough time for me to become thoroughly addicted before its launch. Uh, I'm on to you, you scallywags. Pushers is what you are. But, here we are, I am addicted, and I am going to share that addiction with you. Well, I suppose that saying it like that kind of paints me in a bad light, really, doesn't it? Hmm, let's not think about that too much. Now, Ironcast is, well, it's an amalgamation of genres, really. And as a result of that, it makes it a little bit hard to describe succinctly. I think the easiest way to describe it is to draw parallels between games that it borrows ideas from and and likely had as inspiration, such as Faster Than Light, Puzzle Quest, a plethora of roguelikes in, in the sense that it is a roguelite game, it has permanent death, it has progression, it has the kind of time pressure and an idea of... Uh, missions that you have in Faster Than Light, and it borrows the game core game mechanics from games like Puzzle Quest, that, that is match three kind of games. Now, I realize that some of you might be what, Avak playing a match three game? But as it happens, yes, they, these are very fun. I enjoy puzzle games. And this puzzle game adds enough strategy beyond the just the, the match three kind of mechanic that I really got into it. Also, it's hard as nails. Seriously, I haven't yet been able to win, and I've put a couple of hours into it now, and not a single win yet. Now, I think it might be worth going through the tutorial, simply because it'll play the intro, and the intro will set the scene. But I will probably skip straight out of the tutorial once we're in, and I'll go over the game mechanics myself in a new game. So, uh, let's go ahead and start this up. Now, the year is 1886 and Queen Victoria reigns over her British Empire. The Great War has been raging for over a decade between the British and their neighbours, the French. The war began after the French had developed a powerful new energy source known as Voltite, but declined to share their discovery with the English, the scallywags. The French declared war on Britain in 1875 when the English government refused to return Voltite samples that they had stolen the previous week. Oh, ah, the stealing! Such a... That's such a strong word. We we borrowed the samples. We just may have forgotten to ask first. Okay, stealing? No, we don't do that. Voltite was quite simply the most valuable material in the world, and the British Empire were unwilling to let it go, no matter the cost in human life. Over the following five years, several attempts were made to invade by both nations, with neither being able to gain a foothold lasting more than a few days. The difficulty lay in the process of trying to land ground forces. It was a perilous task, as heavy steam tanks, that's right, steam tanks, this is a steampunk game, they, I refuse to believe that any game cannot be infinitely improved by the addition of steampunk elements to it. This, the, the, the developers here, dread bit, seem to understand this as well. Uh, the steam tanks were quickly targeted and destroyed by artillery before they could move to a safer location. The Anglo-French War seemed at a bitter stalemate. In 1882, designs for a new kind of ground unit became reality. Instead of using tracks and wheels to move these new vehicles, they would walk. They would be large enough to carry multiple weapon systems found on even the largest tanks, but could move faster and fall longer than the smallest scout vehicles. The 20-foot tall brass and iron walkers could also stride over regular defensive and quickly move into populated areas, discouraging Voltite artillery retaliation. Unless the people controlling the Voltite artillery were particular scoundrels and didn't care. These mechanized war machines would come to be known as Ironcast, named after the manufacturing process used to construct them. Although designed for military purposes, the British Army did not own the patents or designs for the Ironcast. The war machines were instead built by a group of wealthy private businessmen and women collectively known as the Consortium of Merit. 
Sick of the duration and bitterness of the Anglo-French War, the consortium developed advanced models of iron cast in order to break the stalemate and declare a victor once and for all. Smartly dressed and devoid of the usual rough qualities found in fighting troops, the iron cast commanders were a whole new breed of tactical genius, eloquently directing their crew in battle from the comfort of their elaborately decorated cockpits, where they sat, pipe in mouth, their smoking jacket, monocle, you know, top hat. Clearly, these these were the aristocracy of of warfare. Look, look down there. Top hats, canes, ah, oh, it's beautiful. Look at the embellishments. It's This is where Amar comes from, I'm fairly certain of it. Uh, when I'm playing Eve, I imagine my pilot is, is more or less like that. I, well, you know, except the fact that he's in a vat of goop. But anyway, this isn't Eve. The Consortium of Merit became the bulwark of England's defences and spearheaded their eventual campaign into France. It is now the 12th of October 1886 and French have landed, uh, sorry, launched an assault on England on a scale never before seen. Close to 100 airships have descended on the south of England, dropping voltite bombs on key military and consortium positions. The British Army are in a disarray. Most of the iron cast commanders have been slain in the attacks, and a massive fleet of French battleships have been sighted in the English Channel. Now, this is what I'm um, drawing the parallel between faster than light from, is because you have a very specific kind of time pressure in much the same way you have in Faster Than Light. It doesn't quite play out in the same way, but you, you still get the same sort of feeling going on. Dozens of enemy ironcast have been dropped inland as a disruptive spearhead force, destroying consortium-owned weapon caches and resource pipelines. It is a dire day for the British Empire. We join our hero, Commander Ares Powell, as she and her ironcast recover from a voltite bomb blast in central London. Now, that was the intro. So we've got the, the, the background to the war. It is time now to actually get to playing the game. Now, I'm not going to go through the tutorial itself. It is quite a good tutorial. It teaches everything. It gives you a little bit of freedom as well. It's not completely on rails. But uh, I'll be explaining the systems as we play anyway. Now, there's one thing I do want to cover. Although this is a permanent de death game, much like Faster Than Light, you, in your any particular run, once your crew and ship are gone, that's it, game game over, you reset. But, much like Faster Than Light, or, or perhaps even more so in, in a way, you have global unlock progress. In Faster Than Light, you could unlock different types of ships. In this, it's much more varied what kind of things you'll unlock. As you play through each game, you gather experience, and that goes into a global pool, and when you die, it'll tot up what experience you got and, and how many unlocks. It could be different types of iron cast, different types of commanders, different sorts of passive um, abilities like more EXP or, or starting HP, that sort of thing. I'm currently at level 6 and I'm not sure if there's a way for me to reset that so I'm not going to worry too much about it. Now we're going to start a new game. There are currently four commanders, there may even be more that unlock over time, and we've got a couple of different commanders. We've got Ares Powell and William Beechwood. William Beechwood is 38 Englishman, owner of Beechwood Munitions Group, and Ares is 27 Welsh woman, uh, 27 year old Welsh woman, occupation CTO of Powell Energy Co. Now, each commander will have different things. Um, the signature augment for Beechwood is matching six or more ammo nodes increases the chance of overdrive for the next weapon system to be fired by 5%. Overdrive is basically critical hits, if you like. In addition, the damage of all projectile-based weapons is boosted by 10%, so this is particularly good, Commander, if you were intending to use a heavy um, projectile weapon setup. Ares matching six or more energy nodes reduces the energy cost of activating the next shield or drive system by one to a minimum of one. The heat cost remains unchanged. In addition, the damage of all energy weapons is boosted by 10%. So, again, Ares then would be better if you're going for more of a energy weapon setup. And also, she's got a cool steampunk vault tight, I assume, prosthetic limb. I mean, nothing says that you are a woman of strength and character than having a crazy cybernetic steampunk limb. Look at the embellishments. Ah, you would do well as an Amarian in Eve, I feel, Ares. You truly would. Uh, absolutely. And we're going to be playing Ares. Well, obviously, because she's Welsh. I mean, come on. Now, we've got two iron cast, uh, iron cast unlocked. We've got the Dunraven and the Orandal. Now, hmm. The Dunraven 
start out with a signature ironclad stability, which is the Dunraven rocket pods. Fires a spread of six small missiles, each striking a random enemy system for 10% of the system's maximum health as damage. It starts out with an energy lance and a light cannon, a shield, and a standard drive, 590 health. Whereas the Orandal has a little bit less health. Um, this has more ammo as well, but... The next energy weapon, uh, based weapon to be fired will ignore 75% of the enemy's shield. Since we're going with Ares, this would be a better one for us, I feel. It has the Energy Lance and the Pulse Repeater Mark 1, which again is a two energy weapons. I think we're going to be going with this one. The Arundel is an unusual machine, to say the least. At its core is an advanced liquid voltite generator able to extract more electrical energy from its power source than any other iron cast. However, whilst this generator provides a greater flow of energy, it is also limits the machine's capacity to carry ammunition. It is named after Arundel Castle in West Sus uh, Sussex, England. That is not a castle that I'm familiar with. Right, let us begin. Okay, now this is our workshop. This is basically our hub where we come after missions, we can gain levels, we can spend scrap that we will learn in missions, and also war assets. Now, war assets, this is pretty important. In Faster Than Light, your the end boss is always the same strength. The only thing that changes between you getting to the end boss uh, from one run to another is how strong your ship is. But in this, war assets are used to reduce the difficulty of the boss encounters. Earn these from successful missions. So as your war assets increase, the boss encounters become less difficult. So it's, it's a, kind of a flip on the formula. But at the same time, you can still make your iron cast more powerful with upgrades. You can have augments to them. We don't have any just yet. You can have completely different systems themselves. So you can uh, equip different items, depending on whether you've uh, unlocked any. You can also have specific abilities added to the Iron Cast. You can have specific abilities added to your commander that they can use. You can go into the workshop where you can use blueprints found in battles or spend scrap to upgrade larger systems. But the cost in scrap is typically enormous. Also, you can use scrap to repair. Now. The main focus of this is on missions. There are a number of days left. This is the boss encounter. It's trying to get to London. It'll t nine days and each mission takes one day. So basically we want to use our time to play different missions. Different missions will have different objectives, different difficulties, different types of rewards. We want to get as much as we can to A, make our iron cast better for the boss fight and B, gain as much war assets as we can to reduce the strength of the boss. Now, let's check out what's going on in Dover. Uh, 145 war assets, 505 scrap, 4,500 EXP. That'll be useful for us. Ten turns to do it in, and it's a battle. This one is a battle, medium, southern on sea. 110 war assets, 510, 4,500. Is this the same? Battle in Portsmouth, 140. Uh, that's better. How about you? 145. But that has more scrap. Hmm. In the immediate aftermath after of France's devastating attack, you must push back against an enemy advance before it is allowed to gain momentum. Destroy the enemy iron cast invader at this location within the turn limit. If the turn limit is reached, the enemy will receive reinforcements. The encounter uh, offensive will have failed and the mission will be lost. Let's not get to that point, shall we? Let us wrap this up quickly. Now, this is our commanding officer, Wireless Telegraph, in effect. Greetings, Commander. This is Lady Emile H. Blackwell, your new commanding officer. Understood, Lady Blackwell. I must ask, where is Lord Butler? Now, that is a little bit of a scripted story that's in the tutorial. Basically, our commanding officer is Lord Butler, but uh, well, we'll find out exactly what happens to Lord Butler in the next couple of things. Unfortunate as it is, it is my charge to inform you that your previous general, Lord Butler, was slain in the blast. I am his replacement. That is unfortunate to say the least, he was quite a man. It is a sad day indeed, but you must focus your efforts on the task at hand, Commander. Move to neutralize the enemy iron cast. We shall rise from the ashes this day. Now, lots of things to look at. The first thing I usually do is I open up this to check on the systems that the enemy iron cast has. 
It has shock coils, which can do what, one shot with between 30 and 78 damage. It has a shot cannon, which has one shot between 25 and 30 damage. It has a hardened drive mark one, which increases the evasion chance by 8% ev for every tier that it's activated. I'll show, I'll show you what that means in a moment, but basically you've got three tiers to your shields and your drive. The drive, when it's activated, adds to your evasion chance, so making it harder for you to even be hit at all, whereas the shield adds to the absorption level of your shield. The first level of activation gives it, a, for this particular shield, gives 5, then the next one 10, then the third one 15 max defense. Now, what that means is that any shot, and this is shot, not attack, some weapons have multiple shots of a lower damage amount, um, but any shot lower than the shield's defensive rating will not do any damage at all. Only damage over that. Now, by comparison, we have our main weapon, which is a pulse repeater, which does 15 to 17 damage per shot, and it does 5 to 10 shots. It's random. If this was at its maximum level of protection, then we probably wouldn't want to use the pulse repeater. Because if it pulls its lowest roll, then it's going to do practically nothing. And even on its highest roll, it's only going to do 2 damage per shot. But our energy lance, which does 75 to 88 for one shot, will still be able to get through the shield and do damage to a system. Now, we can target a specific system. I tend to target the shield. Depends a little bit on how much it's using the shield. But I'll tend to go for the shield to try and do as much damage as I can. Take that offline and then I don't have to worry about it. Now... We have a standard shield. We can go up to 30, so for every layer of activation, we get 10 defense. So at maximum, we'll negate 30 damage entirely. And our drive, uh, the same, 8% per layer of activation. So a maximum evasion is 24. Now, a very key thing to remember about this is every turn, the layer of activation of your shield and your drives goes down by one. Basically, you have to keep topping it up with power in order to run. And what we're going to get to now, we've got a couple of things here. You'll notice that most of these say, like, the, the lightning bolt, that's power. The snowflake is coolant. It costs three power and two coolant to run. Pretty standard fare for a match three game, like Puzzle Quest. We've got ammo, coolant, energy, and repair. Now, you can use repair. We spend five at a time to repair a system a certain amount. Ammo we use for our weapons, they'll require a certain amount of ammo and coolant. Coolant we need but to use a system. We can use a system without coolant, but if we do, we, we um, suffer overheating damage to that system and all systems on the Iron Class, including the hull. Energy is required, flat out required, to turn these on. So without energy we can't do anything. Now in the first round, I can't attack, so I'm just going to use this round to grab a little bit of energy there. Actually, I should have gone along there, rather, but uh, that has helped here. Now, this is a link node. This allows me to move from a regular node to a different color. Normally, I can't do that. But if I go through a link node, I can change the type of node that I'm matching. Now, what we want is to grab as much ammo as we can, but we can only store, I believe, six, I think so. You might wonder if there's a point in taking more than that, since you can't store it, but there is, in that you can get lots of EXP. As you can see, my EXP is going up enormously per link, the longer the link chain is. Now, you get three turns to match gems, on your turn and then activate systems. These don't consume a turn, but matching the gems does. Uh, this is scrap, which we would need to uh, pick up as an optional so that we can take it back to the hangar with us. But I'm thinking, honestly, I want more power. So we'll grab that. There we go, fully charged. We're gonna activate our shield. We're also gonna start walking. Uh, yeah, we're gonna activate that again. So we're at the second layer of shields. Now, I believe the enemy are going to be able to attack on their first round. So that is a little bit of a concern. We can use these abilities. This has a charge time of four. But again, I can't attack in the first round. These are my general augmentations and my system augmentations. Just generally letting me know my passive systems. Now, you, after that, you click done. 
And then it's the enemy turn. Now, before we go to the enemy turn, there's one thing I want to cover, and that is, with Puzzle Quest and many Mash 3 games, both enemies are using the same board. They're drawing from the same grid. You, that has two significant things. Is One, you can't set up chains as easily because your enemy could use them. If you set up something and then it's the enemy's turn, they might just use what you set up. Two, you can generally see how much of certain resources your enemy has, so on and so forth. We can only see how it's coolant level. It does not use this board. It uses its own board. It is playing the same game, and it's gathering the same sort of resources, but we can't see what it's doing. Now, it used its coils there, and it's going to do it again. We took a huge amount of damage to our weapon system there, and it's on the move. Now, we've slowed down because uh, it pulled down one layer of activation there. Now, that was actually a pretty nasty fight, so I'm going to grab as much of these repair nodes as I can. Now, again, this is completely out of the turn order, so I can just go ahead and do that. It doesn't repair my hull, though, and that's important to note. Hmm. Let's grab some energy. I am tempted. If these were just slightly better position, that would be glorious. However, I'm going to go ahead and... With, on his shields at the moment, fire. Good hit. We can do it again. Fire. There we go. Shields are completely destroyed now. He can repair them on his turn, but for the time being, his shields are down. Now, the thing I want to do here is I want more ammo. Uh, I'm going to need three. That is awkward. I could go for four there, but what I wanted to try and do was get to this. That is just not going to work out for me. Um, let's think. Could get a little bit of extra power and... Okay. We'll do that. It's not the best thing I could do, but it'll give me one more shot and give me a little bit more power. Now, this is an overcharge nodule. If we know... That can be linked with any two. So, I can use that as part of a chain of ammo, for example, or as part of a chain of this. I can't link to another colour afterwards, but I can link through it. So, for example, if that was there, a valid chain would be to do that. Now, when you get an overcharge, the next system... You can hold three of them at a time, but the next system that is activated, once you've got one of these, will consume one level of it. So, if you had three, you'd be down to two. And then that system that you activate will perform better in some way. Now, with that down, I would very, very much like to try and take out his shot coils. So, let's fire this weapon. We've got a chance that we might actually do over 100. Did we? Yes, we did. We took it completely offline. There we go. He's almost dead. And that is more or less all we can do. Well, actually, no. I can power this up, start walking, and raise my shields to the third level. There we are. We're at 40% now. Go. Now, there is a 5% chance whenever you use a system that it'll effectively overdrive anyway. The first shot missed us. The second one didn't do anything because we've got 40 shield. And his weapon there can do 30 at maximum. Well, it's game over for you, I'm afraid. But we're going to pick up a bit of coolant so that we don't take any overheat damage. And then we're going to pick up an awful lot of EXP with ammo. And finally... Um, yeah, we'll grab a little bit of extra scrap. There we go. This is pretty much just going to wipe him out anyway, but uh, sure. We'll use this. It'll be overcharged. Or overdrive, rather. And as you can see, much higher damage than normal. And he's gone. There were eight turns left before we would have failed. Come in, Spire. This is Lady Powell. Receiving you well, Commander. Is the task complete? Indeed, Lady Blackwell. The enemy has been destroyed. A small victory, at least on this terrible day. Good work, Commander. Let us hope that this is the first of many victories to come in the near future. 
Return to the hangar bay and be sure to effect any repairs you may require before the next battle. Now that looked easy, but it gets a lot harder as you go through the missions and it progresses through the days. Now these are the rewards. We've got a fair bit of war score. Well, this is the total of rewards. 140 um, war assets, 625 scrap because we also got a little bit of scrap from destroying the enemy and 75 from matching scrap bonuses. We also got a huge chunk of EXP. That's for the mission rewards. That's what we got for actually uh, making the chains. And this is why I would overlink them. And we almost got as much EXP from that as we were getting from the, the mission itself. And a little bit extra from destroying the enemy. Now you can press that again to speed it up. But there we go. We've got our next level. And down here, these are the two um, system blueprints that we have gotten. Now, we'll take our level as soon as we get back to the hangar. And before the next mission, I'll wrap this episode up. Now, to take your level, it's not automatic. You click up here. And you'll have three things you can pick from. Iron cast health increased by 28. Select a passive augmentation or iron cast ability as a reward for reaching a new commander rank. We can take this ability. Uh, additional shot. The next weapon to be activated fires an additional shot. That could be quite useful. It has a five turn cooldown. The uh, Voltite generates a cooling. If com you complete a match of eight or more nodes, you will gain two bonus cooling. That's actually pretty good. Variable heat venting. When activating a system, there is a 25% chance you will consume one less coolant to a minimum of one coolant. That, they're both really good, but uh, we'll go with this one, I think. So that will be a general passive augmentation. We can click on the workshop. We've got a new energy weapon that costs 750 and a new hardened drive that has a max right okay so that would match our shields then in terms of how much it would add each level 10 20 and then finally 30 percent the energy weapon now that really looks good you'll notice that it will actually cycle which weapon you're comparing it to i think that I mean, it does 73 to 131, so it's, it's a powerful weapon, but it has splash damage as well. That is going to be something that we're going to want to pick up for our iron cast as soon as we've got enough scrap for it. I'm not going to spend 90 scrap to repair 90 damage for now. I'm going to hold on to that and... Uh We'll see you in the next battle. But that is going to be it for this episode. I do hope you've enjoyed. And I hope you're looking forward to the next. Where the battles are almost certainly going to be getting much more complicated. And there'll be a little bit more strategy and panicking involved in our future missions. But that's it from me. So until next we meet. And as always, do take care.